cool. Hi, anyone who's on YouTube, hello. Um, I'm going to go over all these images that were posted recently on Instagram for you guys, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, it looks like there's a couple people on the YouTube channel. Um, so all the people that are on the Instagram, if you guys want to see all the ultrasound images I'm talking about, you're going to have to go over to um, the YouTube link that's in the description. Cool, so I guess we'll just get started. Um, so basically, this first image here, if you guys... Um, I, the, the, the target audience I, I have for this uh, kind of series is basically students and first year residents and people that haven't really done a lot of ultrasound. So I'm going to be going over a lot of like um, really basic stuff. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to just pop the questions in either the YouTube chat um, or wherever, and um, I would love to attempt to answer them. So this first ultrasound, I think a key thing that you should always do whenever you're going over any ultrasound images is to look at what probe is being used. So right up here at the top of the, the image, you actually see this little curve thing right here. That's the probe footprint. So when it's curved like that, that means it's the curvilinear probe. So curvilinear probes usually used for like abdominal stuff. Um, you can use it for MSK. It's not typically used for cardiac. It's not typically used for soft tissue. So Whenever you see that curvilinear footprint, you should already have kind of a hint um, that that this is going to be some sort of abdominal imaging. So um, what we have right here is just soft tissue. So you see all this stuff coming down. This is just soft tissue. This right here is the beginning of your peritoneum. And this guy right here that's kind of dark, that's your liver. And you see some vessels in the liver running up and down. And then the thing that we're trying to image in this um, particular scan is actually the gallbladder. So you see the gallbladder there. So the gallbladder should pretty much look like this. This is a nice bright wall of the gallbladder, and it should be what we call anechoic in the middle. So anechoic is basically when um, there's uh, no kind of bright um, image like this over here on either side. Um, so let me see. I'll probably hop off of the. Um, I'll probably hop off the Instagram live thing. So um, if you guys just make sure you. Um, join the YouTube if you're interested in continuing. Um, and obviously there you're gonna be able to see the images and stuff. So, um, all right, I'll see you guys over there. All right, cool guys. So I guess it's just uh, the YouTube stuff now. Let me just get out of this. Uh, okay, cool. So <clears throat> basically, like we were saying, that's the gallbladder. Um, you don't see really much in here. This could be a little bit of sludge down here. Um, one thing that I do want you guys to notice is that you can actually see the common bile duct in this image. Um, so if you look, let me, sorry, I'm turning off my phone. So if you look basically right here, you can see that, let me go back a little bit. So if you look right here, this is kind of what you guys are looking for when you're trying to image the common bile duct. So you see one structure right above another one. So this is por probably portal vein. You want to put color up flow on these kind of things to confirm. But this is portal vein, and this should be common bile duct up here. So when you're looking for that common bile duct, duct obstruction, that's actually where you're going to measure the common bile duct. Um, let's go to our next image here. So this is gallbladder also. So again, first things first, you got to make sure you know which probe you're using. So curvilinear probe up here, and that's going to help you with that image interpretation. So soft tissue. Here is the beginning of your peritoneum. And now this is actually a pathologic finding in the gallbladder. So you see that again, that you have that sac um, that's anechoic in the middle that represents the gallbladder. But then this super bright white line right here is actually a stone. So whenever you have a stone like that, you get a bunch of shadowing behind it. And that's because the ultrasound waves can't actually travel through the stone. Um, so you can see there's liver back there at first at the beginning of the clip, I'll show you. So there's liver and stuff. And then you fan through and now that black shadows in the way and that's because sound can't penetrate that um, that bile or that sorry that uh, gallstone so um, you you can't get any ultrasound image past it so it just looks like shadowing and that's really one of the ways you kind of like help to identify a stone uh, on ultrasound so let's see what we got next here so basically moving on to a completely different exam so this is a, a, a cardiac exam so a couple things to notice Again, basics of ultrasound. So this little M up here, this is branding and important. So this is, um, let's see. Hi, joining late here. So we might've missed it, but can you cover what led to the need to ultrasound each sample? It would be good to understand the whole process. Okay, looks like a stone. That's all true. Sorry, I have to pay more attention to my chat. My my wife just reminded me. Um, so yes, what what do we do? What Why do we image each thing? So. 
Um, I guess like on the Instagram, we have cases and stuff that I'm trying to present, but basically here um, in the ED, I think the most important things you can really scan is gonna be cardiac and lungs, right? So see how the heart's pumping, um, see if you have any pathologic finding on lungs and we'll go over all that stuff. Um, like particulars to the case, I won't really cover, but if you guys have specific questions, I can answer them um, about things. But so here, what we're trying to do is get an apical four chamber view of this heart. So here, um, the what I was saying before is there's a couple things that you have to keep in mind. So the M up here is actually important. It tells you which way the probe indicator that the, the, the ultrasonographer is actually holding is pointed. So generally speaking, when you're doing an ultrasound, the indicator is either gonna be towards the patient's head or towards the patient's right side. Um, cardiac is, is kind of a crazy one because cardiologists do it one way, the ED does it another way. So I'm just gonna like explain to you guys um, the ED kind of perspective, but you'll notice that if you look at cardiology imaging or even some other like emergency departments, their um, orientation is gonna be different. But for us, we have the probe indicator in the apical four towards the patient's kind of right side. So this is uh, the left ventricle over here. And then this is the left atrium up here. And this is the right ventricle over here. And this is the right atrium. So in this patient, as you can see, you don't you don't get great images, um, but you can see the mitral valve opening and closing here, and you can see the LV squeezing, and you can't really make out the RV. So let's go on to the next image. These I think I put a couple cardiac in series. So this is a different view of the heart. This is called a parasternal short a parasternal long axis view of the heart. So what this is is you go right next to the sternum, and for us um, the the probe indicator is going to basically be pointing towards the um, patient's right kind of shoulder. Um, but cardiology is going to be different. And in the cardiology orientation, the ventricle is actually going to be in the opposite side. But for us, you can see left ventricle right here. And in this image, the heart really isn't pumping super well. Um, there's a couple ways um, in general you can decide on something called ejection fraction. That basically tells you how well the heart is pumping. And so um, in the, the parasternal long axis view, um, that one of the ways that people describe is something called EPSS, that stands for E-point septal separation. So what that is, is basically how close the mitral valve is getting to that intraventricular septum right here. Um, and as you can see, it's not getting close at all. And when it's very separated, that suggests that you have a poor ejection fraction. Um, now, there's a lot of things that can make the EPSS not work well. You can imagine if you had a lot of aortic regurgitation, um, then the EPSS wouldn't really be valid. Um, if you have big dilation at the LV base and it wasn't as dilated apically, the EPSS wouldn't be as valid, but it's kind of one of the ways that we try to measure um, ejection fraction um, in a, a quantitative sort of way, because usually we're, as you get better at echo, you'll just kind of be estimating. You'll be looking at a, at a heart and saying, oh, this EF's like, you know, greater than 35 or this ES is, you know, normal. Um, but, you know, as you're starting out, you kind of want other ways to measure. So EPSS is one of those ways. The way you would actually do EPSS is you toss an M-mode cursor right here through the mitral valve, and you can actually measure the separation between the mitral valve leaflet and the intraventricular septum. Um, you know, I didn't do that here because I usually just estimate, um, but that is a way to think about ejection fraction. Um, going over a couple other basic things in this cardiac view, um, on this side of the heart, generally in the parasternal long axis view, you should see three structures. You should see, you should see right ventricle up here, aortic outflow tract right here and left atrium right here. And now I think a good rule of thumb when you start out doing cardiac uh, ultrasound is that those three structures should be about one to one to one. So if you're ever doing a parasternal long and you notice that one of those structures looks really big, um, then you should kind of get cued in that maybe there's something going on there and look a little closer. I think the next image I have um, here, I'll hop back to that one. So this image is a parasternal long again, but you can see a little better kind of some of those structures I was talking about. So I'll pause it here. So here again, you have left ventricle, right? I, I think I should not say right, left ventricle, correct? Because the right's gonna be confusing, but here you have left ventricle, um, here you have left atrium, and then this is actually your left ventricular outflow tract or your aortic root, this whole space right here. And when I, when I play the video again, you can actually see the aortic valve flapping in that section. And up here is gonna be the right ventricle. So remember, right ventricle, aortic outflow tract, left atrium, they should all be about one to one to one. And then you have your left ventricle over here. So I'll play this clip again and, and see if you can make out, you see the aortic valve flipping in there, you see mitral valve opening up in there, and then you see the RV kind of pumping up there. At the end, they start to rotate to a parasternal short axis view that we'll cover. Um, but this is basically a, another parasternal long. 
And as you can see, this ejection fraction also looks really poor. Um, you can see that the EPSS is, is pretty big. The, the, the mitral valve is not even getting close to the septum at all. So I'll go back to this one I had before. This is a better apical four. Um, so not to be get too confusing right off the bat, but this is technically an apical five chamber view. And so what, what is the fifth chamber of the heart, you ask? I, I, it's, it is confusion. Um, this thing right here is actually the fifth chamber. So that's the left ventricular outflow tract. Um, so normally in a normal apical four chamber view, you wouldn't see that. You just see left atrium up here, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. And if you see that guy right there, you call this an apical five chamber view. Um, they labeled it apical four down here because I'm sure that's what they're going for, but that's fine. Um, this ejection fraction actually looks pretty normal as compared to like this one on the parasternal lung that looks pretty crappy. Um, we'll go to this next view here. So this is the next um, parasternal view that you're going to get. So this is called a parasternal short axis view. So when you have that probe next to the patient's sternum with the indicator pointed towards their right shoulder, you're going to rotate that indicator 90 degrees. And now you're basically going to just get the ventricle um, on its short axis. So we can see the left ventricle all the way around here, the whole circumference of it. So when you look at this one, you see it kind of in long axis right here. Now we rotate and now you get it in short axis. And so the right ventricle is actually going to be over here off to the side. And these guys in here, these are the papillary muscles. So to get a good parasternal short axis view, you actually want to see the papillary muscles and not the mitral valve. So the mitral valve will look like kind of like a little fish mouth flapping around in here. Um, and you, if you, if you see that, you want to kind of move a little bit more towards the cardiac apex um, to get a good parasternal short axis view. Um, this is a pretty crummy ejection fraction as well. You can see that a normal ejection fraction would be considered greater than 55%. So the way I kind of teach people to start evaluating ejection fractions is to decide whether or not they think if they were to like kind of put their finger in the middle of that circle, do they think it's that whole circle is closing down um, 55%. And if you look at this heart, you can obviously say that's not the case. This is severely reduced. Um, it's definitely not going down 55%. So let's see what else we got here. Um, so this is a good case overall. So here we have a poor ejection fraction for any, you know, any um, residents or medical students that are in here. Um, here we have a poor ejection fraction. Here we have a poor ejection fraction. Now, our, our clinical question is, is the patient short of breath? And is their poor ejection fraction what's causing them to be short of breath? That's when we move on to the lung ultrasound. So lung ultrasound is actually like one of the easiest ultrasounds to do. Um, but it has a lot of stuff that people kind of don't get um, good at and it's because um, you have to practice it. So one of the things that I think you should notice when you're doing lung ultrasound is first of all the curvilinear probe is usually my go-to. You can use phased array. Um, you can't really use linear if you're looking for A lines or B lines because it doesn't get deep enough. So to see uh, to see B lines you really should see at least down to 10 centimeters and the limit of the linear probe is closer to five. Um, phased array can see that deep but I just think it doesn't look as good. Um, so I almost always use this curvilinear, as you can see the footprint up here, this curvilinear probe for my lung ultrasound. Now, the second key to doing any lung ultrasound is to just stay still. So a lot of people like to slide all around, um, but when you're looking for lung findings, you just plop that probe down on a lung space and you just keep it still there. And that will give you the best idea of if there's any pathologic findings there. So in this image, we're actually seeing what's called beeline. So you can see these little like things that look like spotlights kind of coming down. And that is a sign of um, interstitial edema. So you could have beelines from pneumonia. You could have beelines from, um, you know, uh, a contusion of the lung. But the, the thing that mostly that we talk about is the fact that um, pulmonary edema from congestive heart failure gives you beelines. So this is one of those things you're going to use when you're looking for CHF. Um, and just trying to decide if pulmonary edema is what's causing um, the patient's symptoms, you, you put the probe on and look for beeline. So um, this is actually a, a really good shot of uh, a pleural effusion. So again, we're using this curvilinear probe. Um, and right here at the beginning of the clip, this is all liver. And you remember from the gallbladder things earlier what liver looked like. And this bright white line above the liver is actually the diaphragm. So usually above the diaphragm, you shouldn't see anything. And that's because when the lung sits right up against that anterior portion of the diaphragm, um, the ultrasound beams don't go well, don't travel well through air. So you won't really see anything there at all. When you have all this black space here, that's all fluid. 
And that's because there is something for the ultrasound beams to actually transmit through. Um, so now you have something you can visualize there. So this thing right here is what we call the spine sign. So generally speaking, because of that phenomenon where ultrasound doesn't travel well through a normal aerated lung, um, you don't see the spine continue up above the diaphragm. But here we see spine here, and then it continues well up above the diaphragm. And that's because the ultrasound beams are going all the way through this liquid, liquid and hitting the spine, that bright white line back here. Um, so that's called the spine sign, and that's a sign of a pleural effusion. Now, another interesting thing in this image is you can also see the tip of the lung kind of floating around there. So, um, you know, when you have big effusions like this, you can actually see lung flopping around in the effusion. So this is all like the same patient. Um, so we look on this other side again, we see those spotlights coming from the pleural line. And these are consistent with beelines again. And this would be concerning for pulmonary edema in the right setting. And like we said, we had a heart that has a poor ejection fraction. So we're suspecting that this is pulmonary edema, not pneumonia. And now this is the right lung. See it labeled up here. And we have another effusion. So this one's a little bit more subtle than the last one. On the last one, you had that huge area of black above, above the diaphragm. On this one, you can see that there's only a tiny little area of black and you still see that lung flipping in there. So this is a, a big effusion, but it's much more subtle. Um, let's see what we got in here. Ultrasound guided thoracentesis possibly needed. Yeah, so I agree that I think that um, a lot of cases, um, when it comes to, to pleural effusions, a lot of them are just dealt with by diuresis. So a lot of the time, if you get the intravascular volume of the patient down, um, they're gonna clear their, their pleural effusions. But I completely agree with a, a pleurocentesis. If you have um, a patient that's acutely dyspneic and you go and you find um, a really big effusion on one side or the other, you should definitely um, take that fluid off. That will help them um, breathe a little more comfortably. Um, and then the atelectasis thing is, a, is an interesting question. So it's pretty hard to tell on ultrasound if you have atelectasis or if you have um, pneumonia. So in this clip, you can see a little bit at towards the end of some something that we call air bronchograms. I'll kind of try to keep it paused and see if I can show you what they look like here. Uh, I think we have some better examples later on, um, but basically it's bright white lines, kind of like that inside the lung tissue. This lung's flopping around, so it's hard to tell if it's what's called static or dynamic. So the static air bronchograms are basically like these little, you see air things swimming in the lung. And the, um, sorry, that's dynamic. Dynamic is you see it swimming in the lung and static is where it looks like it's just bright white and it's kind of sitting there. And so the static air bronchograms, as you can imagine, if the lungs collapsed, you're not gonna have air moving in and out of that lung tissue. So it's more consistent with atelectasis. Whereas pneumonia usually have a dynamic air bronchogram because that consolidation, it doesn't actually trap air in the lung. The air can still move freely in and out, but you have consolidated lungs so you can see that air moving in and out. Um, so that's why uh, dynamic is more consistent with pneumonia and a static is more consistent with atelectasis. Um, that being said, with this flopping around, it's hard to tell which, which is which here. Let's see what else we got. So here's a good one. So if anyone's actually paying attention, um, tell me, do you think there's a plural effusion here? Yes or no? Um, I'll go over the other stuff in the image for right now and just explain it to you guys again. Always make sure you look at what probe you're using. So we're using a curvilinear probe here. M's on this side. So that means that the, the indicator is towards the patient's right or the head. So that kind of helps you orient their heads up here. Um, this is the diaphragm right here. Um, you can't see it continue. Um, this is the gallbladder. You see it there. This is all liver. And then this is the spine down here. So it looks like either no one's paying attention or no one wanted to answer. But there is no effusion in this image. There's no um, plural effusion. And... Um, the thing you do kind of see that throws some people off is um, something called mirror artifact. So down here, you see how it's really dark, um, exactly like you're saying. It's it's really dark, and it's because it's actually the, the diaphragm. Yeah, exactly, Nick. There's no spine sign. The diaphragm is actually um, super reflective. So as the ultrasound sends its sound beams down here, a lot of that sound gets reflected off in different directions. Um, and the way the ultrasound actually interprets where the image is in space is time of flight, how long it takes the sound beam to go down and then bounce back and come back to the receiver. So even though some of those things are getting reflected off, the ultrasound still sent them. So it's still sitting there waiting for one of those things to come back. So since there's nothing back here that it can image, because this is all just air, um, some of those, those um, sound waves that come back off the diaphragm um, that are actually just getting repeated, it will interpret as being behind the diaphragm 
um, because it, it doesn't have anything to put back there because it, it's just going off of time of flight. So it kind of pastes some of the liver. And as you can see, it looks like this is liver back here. And that's because it's putting liver back there, thinking that there's something back there just because of time of flight when there's really not. And so Nick's point is probably the best thing. And that's because if the spine ends right here at the diaphragm, you know that there's no fluid up here. And that's because it the way that this reflection artifact works, it's not gonna reflect the spine over here. Um, so the key thing, and when you have something really small like this, is to look for that spine sign. And um, the ultrasound is actually really good at detecting pleural effusions. It can detect something like as small as 50 cc's in the pleural space. So um, you will see very small effusions that look a lot like this, um, but that spine sign is really key there. Let's see what else we got here. So. This is an interesting image as well. This image is um, a FAST scan. So what FAST is, it's a way that we assess trauma patients for uh, intraperitoneal bleeding. Um, you know, because obviously if a patient is unstable and we do a FAST scan and they have um, some free fluid identified in their abdomen, we can, um, you know, suggest that they go right to the operating room. So here we're looking at um, a liver. Um, you can see it kind of floating here, and a kidney right here. Um, again, we're using the curvilinear probe. This is pointing towards the patient's head. And what you see that's pathologic in this image is all this black here shouldn't be there. So there really, in a normal person, shouldn't be any amount of free fluid in the abdomen that's um, separating organs. So as you can see here, there's a big black space, and then at the end of this clip, you see bowel come into the window. So there shouldn't be fluid between the liver and the bowel. The bowel should be right up against it touching it, and the kidney should be right up against touching the liver as well. So when you see this big black pocket here, um, that means there's fluid in there. Now, that being said, if you're not in the setting of a trauma, this could be normal. You know, cirrhotic patients have ascites. This could be ascites. Um, but in the setting of a trauma, your differential is, um, you know, hemorrhage into the abdomen until proven otherwise. So I think I have another clip of a positive fast that's a little less um, obvious. So here we have the same thing. We have um, liver, and then this looks like some bowel, and then you have a small tiny stripe right there. See that black stripe right there? So this is just a small stripe of free fluid between the two of them. So this is much more subtle. Um, this is uh, also a positive fast, um, but one of those times that you really have to be um, looking closely to decide whether or not um, this is uh, free fluid in um, the abdomen. Um, the couple things I want to mention about the FAST scan is in the right upper quadrant with the liver, um, the thing you have to see to call that negative is either the inferior pole of the kidney or the inferior pole of the liver, whichever one's lower. And so if you don't see that inferior pole, you technically can't call that quadrant negative, and you still have to investigate for more free fluid. Free fluid. Um, in the left upper quadrant, however, the spleen is not as adjacent to the diaphragm as the liver is. So fluid actually accumulates above the spleen first on the left upper quadrant. So to call that one definitively negative, you still need to see the, the space between the kidney and the spleen. Um, but what's more important is actually seeing the, the interface between the diaphragm um, and the spleen in the right upper quadrant, or sorry, in the left upper quadrant. Because if you don't see that, you could have fluid that's accumulated between the diaphragm and the spleen um, that is um, getting missed. Um, so those are the two things to remember there. Let's see. So here we go. This is a different type of scan altogether. So this is a testicle scan. So this one's got a funny name. This is called the buddy view. So the right and left testicles are buddies, I guess. Um, and here, what we're evaluating for is testicular torsion. So you can see, again, I think a good thing to remember is always um, look at what probe is being used to decide kind of what type of structure you're probably imaging. So this is the linear probe. You see how it's flat up here? The previous ones were either curved or the um, phased array is a triangle. Um, so this one's flat, so this is a linear probe. Again, you can see that this is uh, telling you where the indicator is, so that's towards the patient's right. Sorry, my dog is in the background um, squeaking some toys. Um, so this is towards the patient's right. So here we have the right testicle and the left testicle. And what we're doing here is we're putting a big um, color flow box on this whole thing. And the reason we're doing that is because um, if you're concerned about torsion, um, one of these should probably have minimal to no color flow. Um, and the other one will have normal color flow. So as you can see here, the both, both of these look pretty normal. There's color flow kind of throughout them. Um, obviously, we're going to have to be a little more 
exact and go and measure venous and arterial Doppler waveforms on each testicle individually. Um, but I usually do this right at the beginning of my scan to kind of give me an idea of whether or not um, one of them looks uh, a little off. Um, now this is another testicle. And as you can see, this one looks way different. So this is a case of um, epididymo or chitis. So basically the testicle and the epididymis are inflamed and infected. Um, so this is just the right, you see it labeled right down here. Um, and you can see how heterogeneous the testicle itself looks and how heterogeneous the epididymis looks. It's all basically just um, abnormal appearing with some surrounding um, edema. Um, like you can see these little stripes of fluid in here and back here. Um, and now if we go to the next one, this is the kind of the same thing. This is a buddy view, um, right testicle, left testicle. And now you can see that this is something called power Doppler. So the other one was color Doppler, and that's where it gives you directionality. Um, the way I remember which direction it is, there you have um, blue and red. So I use the word BART. So blue away, red towards. On power Doppler, there's no directionality. So power Doppler is a good way to just assess any sort of motion in any direction um, when you when you want to just be very sensitive with detection of motion. So here we turned on power Doppler because we're not really worried about, um, you know, if this is arterial or venous. We just want to see whether or not there's a lot of inflammation in the right testicle. Um, so when there's um, a lot of increased blood flow, um, it would suggest that there's increased inflammation and then therefore suggest a diagnosis of epididymo or chitis like we suggested before at the other image. So you can see this is kind of called, we call it tiger striping. So you can see how basically this looks very um, inflamed. There's a lot of um, power Doppler on this side, um, whereas this side is kind of relatively spared. And in addition, you can see that this right testicle is just huge. Like this is way bigger than this one. Like here we go. This is an incidental finding of like a, a ret testes, but um, there's um, nothing really to do about that. But this size comparison is, is pretty obvious. Um, this is the left testicle, right? So the same patient, this is what the left testicle looks like by itself. So if we go back to that first one, here's the right testicle. Just like look at this view, how heterogeneous it is, how much adjacent inflammation there is and stuff. And then if we go back to the left testicle, like, you know, there's a huge difference there. Um, so Nick, what is the common treatment for this? So um, this actually, the, the treatment kind of actually depends on um, the patient's age. Um, there, it's, it's kind of silly because we are judging all of our patients, um, but people who are in the sexually active age group, um, we need to treat um, this as if it's a, a sexually transmitted bacterial infection. Um, so you'd give them things like, um, you know, azithromycin, ceftriaxone um, to treat them for uh, STIs. Whereas if it was um, a patient who's not sexually active age, um, usually you should just ask your patient about these kind of things, dangerous sexual practices, stuff like that, to decide what antibiotics you really want to give them. But if it's a patient that's not sexually active age, um, you're going to be giving them um, more stuff for like E. coli, more common um, bacteria that um, is in the uh, general urinary tract that's not um, a sexually transmitted uh, infection. Good question. All right, let's see. Here's a very abnormal scan. So um, you guys, can anyone make out any of the structures in the scan? It's kind of a crazy one. I mean, I guess it's cheating if you already saw it on the Instagram because I think the answer's on there, but. Um, well, so far I've got nothing. I'll give you a hint that um, back here's the spine. So up here, we have the diaphragm right at the beginning. You can see diaphragm right there. And right below the diaphragm is liver, a tiny shot of liver. And this is, yep, that's lung and that's spine. It's This is super weird looking lung. So um, basically, this was a patient that was post um, cardiac arrest. Um, and it looks like she has either some severe pneumonia or just global atelectasis of this entire lung. Um, so you can pretty much see the whole lung here. Um, and it's all looks just collapsed with some static air bronchograms in it. Um, and there's definitely an effusion up there. Like Nick was saying, there's a spine sign, there's a fusion there. You can see fluid here, you can see fluid back here too. So um, overall pretty abnormal ultrasound. Um, <clears throat> switching gears 100%, this is now an OB ultrasound. Um, so one of the things, um, all right, that's a good that's a good thought on the last one. You said curved probe, so maybe abdomen. That's a good one. Um, 
And then another question, what's all that echogenicity mean throughout the lung? So um, I'll go back to that, I guess. So actually the echogenicity on the lung is um, those air bronchograms we were talking about. So um, these are all likely um, trapped bits of air in there. Um, so this is probably atelectasis like we were talking about before. You know, it's not really specific. Uh, static versus dynamic is not really specific for either atelectasis or pneumonia. Um, but, you know, just looking at the scan in its entirety, it's probably um, probably atelectasis, if I had to guess. Um, but, yeah, going back to this one. So switching gears to OB, um, I think a couple key points when you're doing any OB ultrasound is to know um, what to look for and when to look for it. So just going back to the basics um, here, we see, again, we're using the curvilinear probe. Um, we have the indicator this direction. So this is either towards the patient's head or towards the patient's right. Looking at this image, I can tell you this is towards the patient's head. Um, so imagine that this is the um, ultrasound is placed right at the patient's midline, pointing towards their head, okay? Um, this right here, this big black thing is the bladder. And then this whole guy right here is uterus. So you have vagina connecting to and see cervix right here, and then this is uterus, okay? Um, and now right here, this black circle in the middle of the uterus is something called a gestational sac. So gestational sac is kind of the first sign of pregnancy. So the thing that's important as a student or as a, a novice um, ultrasonographer in the ED um, to remember is that our differential in early pregnancy with abdominal pain or bleeding or anything, the top differential, pretty much the top 10 differentials should always be ectopic, 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 ruptured, ectopic, ectopic, ruptured, ectopic, right? So you need to worry about the life-threatening diseases right off the bat. So if you see this ultrasound, you're basically not going to say this is not, her pain's not from an ectopic. And the reason is, is because this is just a gestational sac. So gestational sac is the earliest sign of pregnancy, but it's not the earliest sign of definitive inner uterine pregnancy. And that's because the next thing that develops after the gestational sac is something called the yolk sac. And what that looks like is like a little tiny Cheerio inside that sac. Um, and basically the reason you can't say a gestational sac alone is a sign of definitive inner uterine pregnancy is because you can have something called a pseudo gestational sac. So when you have an ectopic pregnancy, you have similar home hormone secretion and the endometrium in the uterus can actually um, basically secrete fluids and make a false little sac there um, that has nothing growing inside of it, but it's just a hormonal reaction from the tissue. And it looks like there's a, a normal gestational sac, but it could just be, you know, a fake out. Um, from an ectopic. So whenever you see something like this, the diagnosis that you're going to discharge the patient with is pregnancy of unknown location. And so you're going to send a beta HCG um, and you're going to have them follow up in 48 hours with somebody to get another repeat beta HCG and probably another ultrasound done. And you're going to keep looking for that ultras for that baby until you figure out exactly where it is um, and make sure it's not in a life-threatening location. Um, so just remember that you have gestational sac as the first um, sign of pregnancy, but the first definitive sign of inner uterine pregnancy or wherever it is, is a yolk sac. So you have to see the yolk sac to make that diagnosis of um, inner uterine pregnancy. If you don't see it, you don't know where it is. All right. So again, changing gears. So this is a heart now. Um, so if we, we were talking about this before, the, the kind of different views. So this is an apical four chamber view. Um, right here, you have the left side of the heart. Over here, you have the right side of the heart. And something you can tell right away that's abnormal with this image is just think about it. Right side of the heart is way too big. The right side of the heart should never be bigger than the left side of the heart. So in the ED, we typically use one-to-one -one as our concern. If it's bigger than one-to-one, -one, we're worried that the right heart's abnormal. But I think, um, you know, the, the cardiology standards are a little different. Uh, but, you know, we, we kind of move everything um, uh, to, to, you know, make it a little more specific for some things and a little more sensitive for some things. So we just use one to one generally. Um, so this is definitely ab abnormal. It's enlarged. Um, this is right atrium over here and this is left atrium over here. Um, <clears throat> so just to remind you guys, the apical four chamber view, you're going to kind of be below the patient's um, left nipple um, and pointing up towards the uh, base of the heart um, with your probe indicator towards the patient's right. So this next view here is a parasternal short axis view again. You guys remember this one. So this is LV here. 
and this is RV here. And normally you don't really see too much of the RV on the parasternal short axis view. So if you're seeing some RV, it should just kind of hint you in that maybe there's something going on. It doesn't necessarily mean there is, it can be normal. Um, but the other thing you should look for whenever you see a little bit of RV in the parasternal short axis view is you need to look at this intraventricular septum here. So the intraventricular septum can tell you a lot about RV pressure. So right now it looks pretty good. The intraventricular septum is bowing towards the RV. And when it's contracting, it's kind of contracting um, normal appearing. So if you see it flattened out, that would suggest to you that pressures between RV and LV are at least kind of the same. If you see it actually bowing into the LV, that would suggest that RV pressures are actually higher than LV pressures. So um, RV pressures, the, the, right, the right side of the heart has much lower pressures than the left side, as you can imagine, because the left side's pumping blood to your whole body. Um, so if you see that going on, it should suggest, in the ER at least, that you're worried about a pulmonary embolism. Um, it could be because there's chronic pulmonary artery hypertension, um, or it could be severe COPD exacerbation, but um, your differential should usually be PE until proven otherwise in the acute setting, um, unless you know that the patient typically has an abnormal right heart um, at baseline. Um, now this is another parasternal long axis view. Um, so right here, left ventricle, aortic outflow tract, right ventricle, left atrium. So remember what I said about those three structures on this side of the screen, they should be about one to one to one. So here they look pretty good. You can see the aortic valve opening up nice. And then remember that EPSS, right? E point septal separation kind of thing we talked about. Here you can see that mitral valve is really slapping all the way up against that intraventricular septum. So that would suggest to you that this is probably a normal ejection fraction. And um, the, they're fanning a little bit back and forth, but if I had to guess, I would say that this is almost even hyperdynamic. Um, it's kind of like the, the, the two um, ventricular walls are almost like kissing each other, um, which would suggest that the, the cardiac output's higher than normal. Um, and maybe the patient's like in, in septic shock or something like that. Um, that's something to consider. Here's a, another apical four, oh, kind of a more ap normal apical four. So left ventricle right here. Um, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle. And you see the size here of the right ventricle looks like it's probably ending about that right there. It looks pretty normal compared to the left ventricle. Um, it's, it's at least one to one, if not a little less. And so here we go, we're measuring it. Um, you know, you can't see it, but you can kind of assess where the wall probably is. And if you slide a little more laterally, you might actually be able to see the lateral RV wall. Um, and here you can see measurement one is labeled there. Um, and we have a 3.4 distance, measurement two is a 3.24 distance. So you're supposed to actually measure these ventricles at the level of where the valves kind of open. Um, I have noticed a lot of people tend to measure them down here at the annulus. Um, and as you can imagine, like if you're, you're, your um, cardiac trigone, like where all the, the, all of the valves sit is actually kind of rigid. Um, so if you do have our acute RV dilation, um, it might not be as big right there at the base. So it's good to remember that um, you should kind of measure mid ventricle on both of these um, to actually get a good assessment of RV to LV ratio. Here's an interesting one. So this is something called TAPSI. So a lot of people talk about this and I feel like people don't really understand the concept of what TAPSI is. So um, what it is, is you're in the apical four chamber view and you take this M mode cursor um, and you put it over the tricuspid um, free wall right here, where the RV free wall right where, right where it meets the tricuspid valve. Um, I guess before I cover TAPSI too much, I'll tell you what M mode is. So some people might not even know what M mode is. So basically you take this, um, you click M mode on your machine and you take this line and you can reposition the line anywhere across the ultrasound. And then down here, this little thing will pop up. And what this does is it traces out every dot from the beginning of the ultrasound probe all the way to the end of this line right here on this longitudinally over time. So basically you're seeing what happens along this line over time, kind of pulled out this way. So over here you have, you're gonna have velocities and over here you're gonna have time. So I don't know if that makes sense. Let me know if you guys have questions. I can try to explain that further, but basically it's a flat line that's gonna get pulled out over time here. Um, so what TAPSI is, is you're taking the, um, that, that M mode tracing of the up and down motion of the tricuspid valve and you're actually measuring to see how much it moves. So TAPSI stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So this is a good kind of surrogate for RV function. And that's because the RV kind of, you know, bo both sides of the heart really kind of does like rotational 
coming forwards and um, you know sh uh, coming together motions. And that coming forward motion as part of it will kind of give you an idea of how well the right ventricles right ventricles functioning. Um, so you want to see a tapsy that's greater than 20 millimeters. So here you can see this one's 25 millimeters. Um, so this is a normal tapsy. Less than 20 millimeters would suggest that it's probably a little reduced. Less than 16 is severely reduced. Um, so if you do see an abnormal tapsy in um, the setting of a potential pulmonary embolism, um, that should kind of cue you in to the fact that it, it, it's more it's more likely because the right ventricle is uh, acutely failing. Let's see. So we got another. This looks like the same apical four here. Um, and then this one right here is another type of tracing. So this is a pulse wave Doppler tracing. Um, so on this, you can see that this little line right here has a gateway right there. So this gateway right here is going to give you a velocity tracing right at that gate. So this, um, what we're doing here is doing something called diastology. So what we're trying to measure here is um, the function of um, uh, uh, the, the um, I guess, more how well the diastolic portion of the cardiac cycle is actually working. And um, this tracing right here will give us an idea of that. So what these two little peaks represent is something called um, the E and the A wave. So if you guys remember, I don't know how many um, people are um, in here that have uh, taken a lot of cardiac physiology stuff. But um, if you guys remember, there's basically two kind of parts of your diastolic function. The first one is the passive filling of the ventricle. And the second one is kind of the atrial kick. So the passive filling of the ventricle under normal circumstances is the predominant portion of the ventricular filling. And so that's what we see here. We see that passive filling. It's kind of like a, a negative force as the ventricle relaxes, it kind of sucks blood from the atria in. And then this last little peak right here is the atrial kick. And that should be less predominant in normal diastolic function. So if we see that this atrial kick goes up and this um, uh, passive filling goes down, we actually know that that means that the ventricle is really stiff and it's not really relaxing well. And therefore the kick is more responsible for filling. And that would represent early, early diastolic failure. Um, you also have to do something called tissue Doppler to really um, evaluate for diastology. Um, but we'll cover that more, I'm sure, in some later posts. This is basically the initial evaluation. This would be a normal pattern. Um, this could also represent supernormal, and that's why you need the tissue Doppler, but um, we don't need to go into all that right now. Um, Nick was asking, what other situations um, might you use M-mode for? So that's a good question. There's um, like a lot of measurements that use M-mode, um, kind of general scanning situations. One that people, a lot of people talk about M-mode for is looking for a pneumothorax. Um, so in looking for a pneumothorax, you basically see the pleural line sliding back and forth below the lungs. And so you can use that M mode and it will really tell you if there's motion right there at that pleural line. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of situations where M mode's helpful, um, but then uh, pulse wave Doppler and continuous wave Doppler are probably used a lot more for kind of real things. Um, M mode is kind of one of those things that it can help you kind of cheat when you're having trouble um, looking at certain measurements or looking at certain images. Um, so this is a apical five chamber view. Remember, we talked about that before. So this is your left ventricle, this is your right ventricle. And now this is your aortic outflow tract. So I think I put this image here because yeah, because I was going to talk about this. Um, this is something that is really more important for like uh, critical care and ER people. Um, this is something called um, cardiac VTI or LVOT VTI. Um, so what that stands for is velocity time integral. Um, so what you're looking at here is basically how much blood is flowing out of the left ventricular outflow tract over time. And so this will give you an idea of a patient's cardiac output. So um, if we remember cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate, and then stroke volume equals VTI times aortic root area. So if we assume that the aortic root area is kind of the same in our patient, it shouldn't vary much unless they're having a dissection or something, then we can say that uh, stroke volume equals um, VTI. So if stroke volume equals VTI, then we know that cardiac output equals VTI times heart rate. So as long as we take the patient's heart rate into account, we can actually decide what their cardiac output is as kind of any given time. And so you can imagine if we're giving a patient fluid or ionotropes or chronotropes, and we want to decide whether or not our intervention is actually working, VTI is a great way of, of evaluating that. So you can do it dynamically. You can get a VTI and do a passive leg raise. Um, and wait 30 seconds and see if it increases. And that would say, okay, the VTI increased, so 
um, the patient's probably going to be fluid responsive, so let's give them a bolus. Um, you can also do it a little like less um, actively and do an intervention. Um, measure a VTI, do an intervention, and then come back and remeasure the VTI and see which direction you're going. Um, both of which are pretty good. But the way you do that is getting this pulse wave Doppler right over the left ventricular outflow tract. And then you're going to get these negative deflection tracings right here. And then this is enveloping. This kind of just tells you that you have good standard velocities and directionality right within that pulse wave. Um, and you're going to trace this and you're going to use the measurement package on your machine to actually calculate the VTI for you. So usually we say like less than 18 is, is maybe fluid responsive and greater than 22 is unlikely fluid responsive. So 19.45 is kind of in the no man's land. Um, but if the patient's hypotensive and you see a 19.45 and you know that kind of pretty much equals cardiac output, you could give them something and see if it increases their VTI. All right, so changing back to some more, a little more basic stuff, since that was kind of a little heavy for a few minutes, I'm sorry. Um, so let's kind of revert to some of the things that we um, talked about before. Which probe are we using? We're using this curvilinear probe here, right? Indicators over here, so probably towards the patient's head or towards the patient's right. Now, this is skin, soft tissue here. Then we're seeing peritoneum right here, the peritoneal line, and now this is liver. So you see liver coming up here, you see the vessels in the, in the liver, and now this guy again right here is gallbladder. But what do you notice about the gallbladder? It's got something in it, right? We talked about this before. You see those bright white stones right there with shadowing behind them. So um, remember, the ultrasound waves don't travel well through these stones because they're so dense. So you get a big shadow behind both of them. So that's kind of a way that you can identify stones um, on the ultrasound that are in the gallbladder. So fanning back and forth, you see them come and go. Let's see what we got next. So this is another view kind of the same stones. You can see that their shadowing is still going away from the probe, which is how it should look. And to really call this gallbladder negative, you have to see the neck pretty clearly. Because if you don't see the neck, then... Um, you don't know that there's not a stone lodged in the neck. Um, so there are five signs of acute cholecystitis on ultrasound. So, you know, people see stones and they think, oh, it must be cholecystitis. Really, if you just see stones, your diagnosis is cholelithiasis, maybe not even symptomatic cholelithiasis, depending on the patient's chief complaint. So the five signs of cholecystitis um, are um, a gallbladder anterior wall greater than three millimeters, um, pericholecystic fluid, uh, sonographic Murphy's. Um, the one that I was just mentioning is something called sin sign, stone in neck. So if you have a stone that's in the gallbladder neck and despite rolling the patient, it stays lodged in the neck, um, that's one of the signs of acute cholecystitis. And then the last one is um, something called hydropic gallbladder. And that's an overall gallbladder that measures more than um, 10, centimeter, 10 centimeters long and five centimeters wide. So if you see a hydropic gallbladder, that's kind of another one of those like softish signs of um, acute cholecystitis. So if you're not worried about acute cholecystitis and you're worried about polydocolithiasis, which is basically where you have obstruction of the common bile duct, um, this is what you have to do. Um, so you have to measure the CBD, the common bile duct, um, as it's exiting the liver. So here you have portal vein, here you have common bile duct, and this measures 0.51. So typically we say um, in the ED, we say a 40-year-old should have uh, a 4 uh, millimeter common bile duct. And then for every 10 years over 40 they are, they get another millimeter added on. Um, if you've had your gallbladder removed, it can be up to um, 10 millimeters or one centimeter, um, and that's normal. Um, that being said, even young people can have common bile ducts that measure um, seven millimeters and be normal. So you really have to kind of take the clinical situation into account. So here again, you guys see curvilinear probe, liver, gallbladder, you see a nice stone right there, another stone there, a lot of shadowing. So just get used to looking at the gallbladder and trying to pick out stones. Um, sometimes it's a little more subtle than this, and you have to really pay attention to if there's a lot of shadowing behind it. So here's another good one. So what do you guys notice um, at the beginning of this clip? So some of you guys might have seen this right here and thought, oh, there's a bunch of shadowing right at the beginning, there's a bunch of shadowing and there's like a couple of lines, maybe that's a stone there. That's actually bowel that's just adjacent to um, the liver. Um, and it's just giving you a lot of shadowing. So you always have to remember to image something in two planes, because if you see that and you're kind of questioning, um, you need to swing um, your probe to uh, the other plane and make sure it's not within the gallbladder.
And now here's measuring the anterior gallbladder wall, like we said, greater than three millimeters is concerning for acute polycystitis. Um, and now here, I posted this image the other day, there's another finding in here that you may not notice if you're really paying all attention, all your attention to the gallbladder. So curvilinear probe indicated towards the patient's head. Here we got liver, here we got gallbladder. Right here is actually kidney. And all this big black stuff within the kidney is, is abnormal. So you shouldn't normally see that much dilation of the collecting system within the kidney. So this is hydronephrosis on the right. Um, so that is, you know, concerning for maybe a possible obstruction. Sorry, my dog's doing his thing again. Uh, so that's concerning for possible obstruction or, um, you know, something else that's causing a, a blockage of the ureter that's causing backup into the kidney. Um, so just pay attention whenever you're doing your scans to try to look for all the other possible things uh, that could be in there. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, so first things first, right? What probe are we using? So this is a linear probe, right? You have a flat footprint up here. So linear probe, like we said before, five is pretty much its limit of any sort of depth. So people are using this to look at like little small things, you know, um, things that are like abscesses, or in this case, we're looking at a rib. So here, the bright white is bone. So anytime you hit bone, the ultrasound waves don't travel through it well at all. So you basically mostly get black behind them, a lot of shadowing. Um, but you can see it's disrupted here. So you actually have a rib fracture that was identified here using the linear probe. This little black here is a tiny bit of fluid. Um, so that's a little bit of hematoma that's just kind of sitting on top of the rib. Um, so it's pretty cool that you can identify fractures with the ultrasound. Here's a more obvious one. So rib over here, rib over here, and then big hematoma on top of it. So um, definitely a fracture there. And so here's another musculoskeletal um, ultrasound that I wanted to show you guys. Um, this is the curvilinear probe again, right? So we're looking at a little bit of deeper stuff. Here you see bone coming up here. This is all bone. This is actually a pediatric hip. As you can see, it's labeled right hip here. Um, and then this is a little bit of a, a joint effusion here. So a joint effusion in the hip is considered pathologic if it's greater than five millimeters or two millimeters bigger than the other side. So um, you can see that here. Um, there's no associated fracture. That's probably a growth plate. Um, and then if we compare it to the other side, you can see this is all fluid. All this black right here is fluid. So all this fluid is layered over the hip. And on this side, you have no fluid. So that's kind of, uh, as you can tell, uh, abnormal compared to the other side. Um, and then I guess just going back to the kind of the basics, fluid is always going to appear generally anechoic um, or hypoechoic, like black on ultrasound. Um, whereas tissue is going to be some other shade of, you know, the most dense being bone white versus like skin and stuff kind of gray. So here's the left hip just fanning through as you can see there's no huge effusion like there was on the other side. Um, so that just goes to show you it's pretty easy to identify stuff like that on ultrasound which is cool. All right so this is another scan that we do all the time that I think people um, are not as great at as um, they should be. This is uh, the like a DVT scan. So um, what you're looking for when you do a DVT scan is right here up at the top you're going to want to be right here at this saphenofemoral junction and then down here you're going to want to see where this popliteal vein divides in two so um, the way i remember the vessels right up at the top is navel nerve artery vein empty space and lymphatics and that's going from um from lateral to medial so you have your nerve artery vein and then empty space and then lymphatics so you'll see on the ultrasound here um, this is the right fem and then indicator is going to be this direction um, so this is actually femoral artery here, and this is vein. So this is that saphenofemoral junction right here that we were talking about. You see that vein there and that other vein coming off. So that's that junction right there. And what you want to do whenever you're doing a DVT scan is you have to compress. And you have to compress the, the vessel all the way down. And if it doesn't collapse all the way, like you're seeing the vein collapse here, that means there's a clot in that vessel. Um, so that's the first spot of compression. And then the next spot we do is that fem. So here's the, fem, uh, sorry, the popliteal. So here's the popliteal artery right here. And then you see that bifurcation um, that was down here. This is the bifurcation into the anterior and posterior tibial veins. Um, so you want to notice that bifurcation and that's where you're going to compress. And as you can see, these two veins collapse all the way when you compress. So there's no clot there. So more vascular imaging. So aorta is another one that you kind of have to um, memorize uh, some some structures for 
Um, so there is the proximal aorta, the mid aorta, and then the distal aorta that you have to measure all of them. So this is a still image of the proximal aorta. So this is where you measure that is at the celiac trunk. So here you have celiac trunk coming off of the proximal aorta. And then over each side, you have more vessels. So um, this one over here is going to be the, the hepatic artery. And this one's the splenic artery. The celiac trunk also gives off left gastric, which we don't see. And then you have IVC over here. Um, so that's kind of what you identify as your proximal point. And then your midpoint is actually something called the um, superior mesenteric artery, the SMA. Um, so you have aorta here. This is the SMA, IVC. Underneath here, you have the left renal vein. And then this over here is splenic vein running into the splenic confluence. So we'll look at those in live images here. So this is the first one, aorta proximal. You can see it's labeled. Um, so you use the spine back here to kind of try to help you identify where the aorta is going to be. So as you can see, it's like super bright and there's a lot of shadowing and that's the bone from the spine. So if you're ever having trouble finding the aorta, just try to identify that spine sign and then you can figure out where it is based on that. So here's aorta here, here's IVC here, and you can see celiac trunk coming off and splitting into two right there. So that's your proximal aorta. And then this one's mid, so aorta here, IVC here. SMA there, it's kind of like we call it the pie in the sky view. So you see that little SMA there. And then this over here is your splenic vein coming over. And then finally, the distal aorta is just a simple bifurcation. So you just see the aorta here, and then you see it split into two vessels as we move down. And that's going to be your last point of aortic measurement. So the point of looking at aorta is to decide if it's if there's an aneurysm or not. So the measurements to remember it less than two centimeters is normal. Um, two to three is considered a catatic, and then greater than three is aneurysmal. So if you're in the ER and you have someone with flank pain, you're concerned about a AAA, um, a pretty easy thing to do is just grab the ultrasound and scan down and measure the aorta um, and decide whether or not you are really concerned about a AAA. So here's a series of bladder images of, um, or, or urinary system images. So this is the right kidney. Um, so we were talking before about hydronephrosis. So um, here we're using the phased array probe. You can see it's a triangle. It's a little atypical for scanning kidneys, but that probably means there's some difficulty because um, the phased array has actually got a smaller footprint and it's easier to fit in between the ribs. Um, so if we're using a phased array for some sort of abdominal thing, right upper quadrant or right kidney, it's usually because we're having trouble getting between the rib shadows. Um, so here you can see the right kidney, and then there's some dilation of this these structures in here. So that's the renal pelvis and um, some of the calyces, and they're a little bit dilated. So if we compare that to the other side, this is the left kidney, you can see that there's none of that. that like it looks, <laughs> there's no black in there um, comparatively. There's a, just a tiny bit. So let's look back at the right one. So all that dilation in there, and then this one has none of it. So this would be just just small amount of hydronephrosis. And then if we look at the bladder, we know that the indicator is towards the patient's right. So the right kidney was the one we were worried about. We have skin up here. These are vessels. These are the iliac vessels. And then this guy right here is bladder. When you see it come in, it's a big black thing right there. So his bladder is pretty empty, um, but there's a little something there right at the end that we're concerned about. That looks like a possible kidney stone. So we got a little bit of color flow on there. So this is actually called the twinkle sign. So this is described in the literature as alternating um, kind of blue and red on color flow Doppler right behind a stone. And that basically suggests that there's a stone in that location. So you should put the color flow anywhere you're concerned there's a stone, like the three most common locations. Out of, out of the three, you can see them at two. So um, the urethral-pelvic junction from the kidney and then the uh, urethral-vesicular junction right here is what we're looking at. So if you see that little twinkly sign, but you don't see a stone, you should still think there's probably a stone there because the twinkle sign is actually better at identifying stones than actually visualizing the stone itself. So then we got another image of it and we we're actually able to measure it, um, which is pretty cool. So um, here you can see bladder and then we're measuring the stone um, 0.43 centimeters. So that's a four millimeter stone. Um, the likelihood of passing that is like 95%. So this patient can probably go home and have their stone passed. So this is another um, cardiac view. Um, this one is like a short axis, but looking specifically at the aortic valve. Um, so I posted this one because I was concerned that this uh, actually valve is not really opening here, that this is a functional bicuspid valve um, um, rather than the normal aortic tricuspid valve. So you can see that this portion right here doesn't look like it's opening. Um, only this leaflet down here looks like it is opening. That's why I posted this one um, to 
try and get some feedbacks from some people. But as you can see in the apical five, here's left ventricle, here's right ventricle. And so this is really calcified. And the only leaf blue that looks like it's opening is that one that's flipping open right there. Um, so this is concerning to me that that um, other leaflet's not opening. Put some color flow on it. And as you can see, the color flow um, goes only through that little channel right there. There's no um, actual color flow through the whole aortic root. Um, so that looks pretty tight. Um, when I checked velocities on the valve, it was actually normal. So there's no real associated like um, uh, stenosis uh, or anything, but it just looks like it's probably functionally bicuspid. Here's some more views of it. Same thing here. I put color flow on the parasternal short because you see that thing is not, sorry, parasternal long because you see that thing is not opening. All right, so here is, um, I think, the final image we're going to do today. So this is um, a transesophageal echo. Um, so this is where you actually put the, the probe down the patient's esophagus, and you're imaging the uh, heart from behind. So the closest structure is pretty much always the left atrium um, that you're shooting through. Um, and then this is something called the right um, uh, the right ventricle inflow outflow tract view. So up here, you're seeing the right atrium. Here's right ventricle, and here's pulmonary artery. So you actually see the entire circulation of the right side. This is like a really cool view for, to do in a resuscitation case when you're worried about a pulmonary embolism, because you can pretty quickly decide if there's anything wrong with the whole right side of the heart. Right here in the middle, again, you see that aortic valve, and this one looks like it's opening well. You can see all three leaflets, um, and they're opening pretty cleanly. Um, obviously, the images are way better on the transesophageal probe um, than they are on the um, phased array probe um, doing a, a, a transthoracic, but I know it's just, uh, it's it's pretty cool to see. Um, so this is another one of the, a little bit of the RV inflow outflow where we're starting to see a little bit more of the pulmonary artery. And then finally, we kind of go over and you'll see pulmonary arteries, this one right here, actually. So this is going to be curving around. Imagine this curves around and goes back to the right ventricle. And this one right here is actually aorta. So this guy right here is aorta. And this is the um, right pulmonary artery curving over. This is the main pulmonary artery here. So as you can see, we image that whole pulmonary artery um, and there was no signs of clots or anything in there. So basically that would suggest that whatever this patient was, you know, uh, whatever they were in arrest for was not, um, was not from a pulmonary embolism. Well, I think I'm going to be done for tonight, guys. It's been an hour. Um, that was pretty fun. I think that I'd love your feedback if you have any thoughts about that. And, uh, if you think it needs to be more basic or more advanced, or if I should break it up into like super basic and maybe some more advanced stuff, let me know. Um, either way, it was fun being with you guys and